Welcome to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the president of Creation Training Initiative, or CTI, where our mission is to equip other Christians with the skills and knowledge to be able to effectively teach and speak about biblical creation and apologetics. We're currently in a series called Understanding the Basics of Biblical Creation. And the series part we're in right now deals with the Genesis Flood. We've already done two sections, one called the Genesis Flood and the Bible, and the second part was the Genesis Flood and Geology. Now we will do the third part of the Genesis Flood called the Genesis Flood and the Fossil Record. Now we often hear that the Fossil Record supports evolution. The, for decades, students have been taught that we have this geologic column it starts at the very bottom with the least complex creatures and gradually moves up to more and more complex creatures. Now, what we find there in the textbooks are the marine creatures on the bottom, then followed by the fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, and finally man. And we're told this took millions and millions of years of ev evolutionary time. Now, this is taught as a fact in our public school systems. But is it really a fact? Are students being taught all the evidence, or are they just being taught evolution? What I'd like to do here in this lesson is take a look at six evidences, six evidences that I believe clearly show that evolution is not true, the fossil record does not support evolution, but rather supports the biblical model of created after their kind, and that there was a real Genesis flood that occurred worldwide. So the six evidences, we'll look at the Cambrian explosion, we'll look at the lack of transitional fossils everywhere. Third, we'll look at textbooks and deception used in the textbooks. Third, we'll look, fourth, we'll look at the history of assumptions and mistakes done by evolutionists. Fifth, we'll look at fossil graveyards. And sixth, we'll look at marine fossils on top of mountains. So let's go to evidence one, the Cambrian explosion. Textbooks, again, show this picture of a progression of creatures from the simplest on the bottom to the more complex as we move up towards the top. However, there's a major problem in this picture and the story given by the evolutionist. See, if we go down to the bottom layers, the very bottom layers called the Precambrian layers in the Cambrian system, what we find down there are fossils of single cells. Yes, we do find fossils of single cells. We also find down there very complex creatures like trilobites, seashells, jellyfish, and other types of seashells. We even find fish with backbones down at those layers. Now, there's every major body plan we find at those bottom layers. Well, here's the problem for evolution. Since we do find fossils of single cells, we should also find fossils of two cell, 10 cell, 100 cell, 1,000 cell, million cell creatures. But what we actually find down there are no transitions leading up to these complex creatures. Absolutely none, which really and completely refutes the evolution story. Now again, this is called the Cambrian explosion. According to the worldview of evolution, highly complex creatures should have taken millions of years and many transitions to evolve to what we see down there. Yet, there is no evidence <coughs> for their evolution. Cambrian record contains representatives of every major body plan. Every major body plan, every major phyla suddenly appears in the fossil record with no transitions leading up to it. Let me read to you now a quote from one of our modern biology textbooks to show you what's really happening in our school systems. And it states, Paleontologists called the diversification of life during the early Cambrian period the Cambrian explosion. <clears throat> For the first time, organisms had hard parts, including shells and outer skeletons. During the Cambrian period, the first known representatives of the animal phyla or body plans appeared. Now, that's an interesting story, but what's more interesting is what they did not tell you in these textbooks. What they didn't tell you, and they refused to tell our youth, is in this great explosion of complex creatures, not one single transitional fossil or creature was found leading up to these very complex parts. Folks, that is an example of deception. In other words, they're trying to support evolution by not talking about the observable evidence. Now, let me read you another quote by Dr. Norman Nevin, who's a professor of medical genetics. And he states, 
The evidence points to the appearance of many new animal forms and body plans in the fossils without, notice that, without transitional fossils or common ancestors in the early, in the early Cambrian rocks. As many as 35 phyla body plans and between 32 to 48 subphyla and classes of animals appear abruptly. Apparently, from nowhere at all, fully formed and no fossil evidence that they branched off from common ancestors. In other words, that is exactly what we find. So at the bottom layers of the fossil record, the Precambrian layers in the Cambrian system, it clearly supports, in the beginning, God created every creature after its kind and not evolutionism. Well, let's go to evidence number two then, called the lack of transitional fossils everywhere. Organisms that we have alive today, when we find their fossil, they look almost identical, no real change at all. For example, starfish have always looked like starfish. Shrimp, lobsters have always looked like lobsters. That's what the fossil record shows. Horseshoe crabs, Dragonflies, frogs, when we find their fossils, they look identical to what they look like today. Alligators, lizards, birds, turtles, mammals, when we find their fossils, they look identical to what we have living today. Now, as the fossil record shows, these animals living today are essentially unchanged in the fossil record. Now, if evolution was true, if evolution was really, really true, we should find some very convincing transitional creatures. For instance, if evolution was true, we should find things like the bird fish, or maybe the bird dog, or the cat bird, or how about the tiger deer, or the bunny cat, or the gator bird, or even maybe a sheep wolf. But you see, none of these kind of creatures are found. No transitions are, real, are really found in the fossil record. Let's take a look at some of the famous examples used by evolutionists in our textbooks to promote evolution. First one is called the coelacanth. What it is, it's a lobed finned fish, once known for its fossils found all over the world. This was considered by many to be a transitional creature or missing link between fish and amphibians. It was claimed by the evolutionists that this creature was growing legs and walking up on the land. And they have found fossils of these creatures. They date back to 400 million years. Now, that's according to evolutionist dating. They date these fossils of this lobe fin fish called the coelacan 400 million years. Now, here's the evidence. In 1938, coelacans were found still living. And what did they look like? Well, I'll give you a clue. They did not have legs. The coelacanth still looked like a fish. It had no legs, 100% still fish. No changes in these alleged 400 million years. Once again, a complete mis misrepresentation of the fossil record by the evolutionist and being taught in our public school systems as a fact of evolution. Then we have the horseshoe crab. The fossil record of the horseshoe crabs date back going to evolutionists, 425 million years. Yet, there's been no change in the horseshoe crabs we have today. No change in this creature over 425 million years. No evolution there. Also, evolutionists have found fossils of alligators. They date to be 100 million years old, and they look identical to alligators living today. Evolutionists have found a fossil of a 55 million year old bat. Now this is according to evolutionist dating and timing. 55 million year old fossil bat, and guess what it looks like? Bats still living today. No evolution anywhere. Now here's Dr. Norman Nevin again, professor of medical genetics, and he states, the fossil record does not show a continuous gradual evolution, but rather an abrupt and sudden emergence of new life forms. Many organisms appear without known ancestors. That is based on the fact of what we observe. <clears throat> now here's another quote, Thomas Woodward, PhD in communications and the rhetoric of science. And he states, if all creatures 
have developed from earlier, more primitive ancestors over eons of steady evolution, why do we never seem to find a trace of that development in the fossil record? Well, there's two evidences. Let's go to our third evidence now, textbooks and deception. Now, when I train youth, when I get in a youth group and I train them about the fossil record, I train them to ask or think about one very serious question to ask when they see these pictures of fossils and alleged transitions in the textbook. And the question is this, how much of that fossil was actually found and how much was drawn in by the artist to support evolution? So how much of that fossil was actually found and how much was drawn in by the evolutionist? Let's take, for example, whale evolution. We open up these textbooks and we find these pictures of transitional creatures leading from some land-like mammal into a whale. And they show maybe three or four of these transitional creatures. Well, here's the problem. None of those transitional creatures have been found. They've all been drawn in by the artist. Let's take, for example, one specific one here called Pachycetus. Now, Pachycetus, according to evolutionists, was a land mammal that is transitioning into becoming a whale in the oceans. Now, how much of the fossil did they find? Well, first of all, we see in the textbook a picture of this Pachycetus swimming around in the ocean, kind of a transitional creature between a whale and a wolf-like creature land mammal. And they show this as convincing evidence. But let's ask that question again. How much of the fossil was actually found and how much was drawn in by the artist? Well, the actual component of the fossil that was found for this Pachycetus creature was only a few fragments of a skull. None of the rest of the body was found. Only a few fragments of the skull, and they draw this complete creature, making it look half whale and part wolf-like creature, and swimming around in the ocean. Now, when they found the rest of the bones that went with that skull, it was rather convincing. It was not a whale. It was not a transitional creature. It was a land mammal with four legs capable of running around the land like a wolf-like creature, and not capable of going into the oceans. Again, a complete misrepresentation by the evolutionists to deceive our students. Then another famous creature is called Archaeopteryx. This is the supposed transition between a dinosaur and a bird. And they draw feathers all over this creature. Now, let's ask ourselves, what evidence do they have to support this was a transitional creature? between a, a dinosaur and a bird? Well, first of all, it has feathers. That's interesting, because birds have feathers. Secondly, it has claws on its wings, and that makes it transitional. And third, they say, it has teeth. And that is called the transitional creature. Now, can I show you something about the deception here? What are they not telling our students that they have found about this creature called Archaeopteryx? Well, number one, this creature had perching feet, not like a reptile or a dinosaur. Birds have perching feet, not reptiles. Second, the impression of the feathers that have been found on these Archaeopteryx fossils are identical to modern birds today. In other words, there's absolutely no transition anywhere in the fossil record of scales on a dinosaur changing into feathers. What we find in the fossil record are fully form feathers identical to birds today. Third, the cranium or the skull is bird-like and not reptile-like. Fourth, the teeth. Now this bird did have teeth. Archaeopteryx did have teeth. But some birds we found in the fossil record also have teeth. And the teeth on this Archaeopteryx creature were identical to bird teeth and not reptiles. Then it had claws on its wings. But we have birds today that have claws on their wings. The young hoaxent bird and the ostrich both have hooks or claws on their wings. But they are 100% birds, not transitional. And finally, according to evolutionists, they have found fully formed birds that according to their dating is six, are 65 million years older than Archaeopteryx. Well, wait a minute. If birds were already around for 65 million years, why was this Archaeopteryx creature still changing into a bird? It doesn't make any sense. 
So again, a mistranslation of the fossil record and deception by our textbook authors by not presenting all the evidence. What about the ape men we see in the textbooks? Well, we find these wonderful pictures of the many strange looking creatures, half ape, half human. But again, let's ask that question. How much of the fossil was actually found and how much was drawn in by the artist? Because seeing all these alleged ape men creatures, all we find are very few fragments of the skull and jawbone and teeth. Then they hire the artist to draw these pictures in. Again, very deceptive. And then what about the fact that when we find these fossils, we don't find eyeballs, we don't find noses, and we don't find hair. See, the artists are chosen to draw these creatures to make them look like a transitional creature. Well, let's go to our next evidence. History of mistakes by the evolutionists. A tremendous history of mistakes, misinterpretation of the evidence. And let's start with this famous creature called Nebraska Man. And I love to ask the audience, where did we find Nebraska Man? And it's easy, Nebraska. Now, what did they find? They must have found a lot of fossil evidence for Nebraska Man. Why? Because they were able to completely put together and draw these pictures of the entire Nebraska Man, his wife, his family, and the environment they lived in. Tremendous amount of fossil evidence to support Nebraska Man. How much did they find? A tooth. A single tooth is all that was found. And from that, they were able to draw the complete Nebraska man, wife, family, environment he lived in. Folks, that is not science. That is what you call evolutionism or misrepresentation of the evidence. Now, when they found the rest of the fossil went with this tooth, they discovered it was not an ape's tooth. It was not even a human tooth. It was a pig's tooth. And I'd like to add this on. It was the first time a pig ever made a monkey out of a man. So again, misrepresentation of the fossil record to support evolution and not real science. Then we had Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man claimed to be 500 million years old, claimed to be the tr transitional creature between apes and humans, and, and lasted in our school systems for 50 years, taught as the fact of evolution for 50 years when somebody finally took a look at the real evidence, the real bones, and what they discovered was they had been chemically stained to make them appear old, and the teeth had file marks on them. They had been filed down to make them fit. See, all they found were a fraction of a skull, ape-like skull, and some teeth. And what they did is they chemically stained these bones, filed them down to make them fit together, went out and buried them. And somebody who happened to believe in evolution found these bones, immediately claimed the fact of evolution, when in fact, it is now a known fraud. But it lasted in our public education system for 50 years as the fact of evolution. Then we have another famous creature called Archaeoraptor. Not Archaeopteryx, but Archaeoraptor. This was found not too long ago. And it was claimed to be the transitional creature, again, between reptile or dinosaurs and birds. And even one of our famous journals, the National Geographic ran articles all over about Archaeoraptor, the famous transitional creature, colored pictures right in there, the tr true transitional creature, the fact of evolution. Then the truth came out. The feather imprints had been pasted on to this fossil. It did not have feathers at all. Once again, another fraud by evolutionists, a history of mistakes by evolutionists. Then we had the fossil horses, and we still see this in our textbooks. They have the horses lined up, from, lined up from small to large. And this, they show, is the fact of evolution, when the fact is the smallest creature there is not even related to horses in any way. And then <clears throat> what they don't tell you, because they claim these horses had different toes, two toes, one toe, three toes. But here's the real evidence. We find all these types of horses buried in the same sediment layers. That means they all lived at the same time. We even find them inverted in the wrong order the evolutionists claim they found them. So again, another great mistake by the evolutionists, but they still keep this in the textbooks. Did you know I can take a series of dogs and line them up from small to large? Is that evolution? No, they're all dogs. So be careful of what we're finding in our textbooks. And then again, there's that famous coelacanth creature. 
that is supposedly 400 million years old, still living today, is not a transition, has no legs. Other famous mistakes, junk DNA. For many years, evolution would say about 97% of our DNA was nothing more than junk. It's left over from our days of evolving from ape-like creatures. And why did they say this? Well, because only about 3% of our DNA codes for making proteins. And if only 3% codes for making proteins, then the rest of it must just be junk. It doesn't do any, have any instructions in it. Well, that held back scientific progress for many years. Because you see, it has now been shown that we don't have junk DNA. Almost all of this DNA today is recognized for having a real purpose. And without it, we're not alive, folks. So again, evolution has made mistakes and held back scientific progress. Now let's go to evidence number five, fossil graveyards. Now, how are fossils formed? Well, a creature must be buried rapidly to keep the, the scavengers away and keep the oxygen out. That's how fossils are formed. You just don't die and lay on the ground and become a fossil. You must be buried rapidly. Well, one of the things we find all over this planet are called fossil graveyards. That's where we find many, many fossils all buried and mangled together. For example, let's go to Nebraska. 9,000 animals were discovered there, all broken and fossilized together. Now, what kind of animals are we talking about? Well, we're talking about rhinoceroses, horses, camels, giant wild boars, birds, plants, seashells, and fish. Now, wait a minute. All these creatures don't live in the same zone. How did fish and seashells get up there with camels and horses and giant wild boars? It would take a catastrophic event to do this, not long, slow processes. And we find all these creatures buried in sediments laid down by water. Then we can go to Wyoming. They found 483 dinosaurs all buried in a seven mile long area. Now, how do you get 483 dinosaurs all buried together? Well, I guarantee it's not done this way. All these dinosaurs get together and they decide, well, I think I'm gonna die here with my relatives and maybe we'll become a fossil. That's not how it happens, folks. All these creatures had to be buried at the same time by sediments that were pushed there by water because that's exactly what they're found in, sediments laid down by water. Then we have Utah. Over 70 different kinds of animals are buried there in a fossil graveyard, including dinosaurs. Yes, we do find dinosaurs buried with different kinds of creatures. We can go to Alaska, another fossil graveyard, where we find bears, wolves, fox, saber-toothed cats, horses, sheep, camels, and many more kinds of animals, all buried and fossilized together. The Grand Canyon, which is about a mile above sea level, what do we find there? In about a seven-foot thick area, they have discovered billions, that's with a B, billions of seashells called nautilites. Now, how do you get billions of creatures all buried in a seven-foot thick area? That has to be a catastrophic process. That cannot happen by long, slow processes. So when we look at the fossil graveyards, they are a great testimony to a worldwide flood and not long, slow processes. Now let's go to evidence number six, fossils on top of mountains. What do we find on mountains? When we go down to South America, the Andes Mountains, they discovered whale fossils about a third of the way up the mountains. Now, one of the things we did not find with these whale fossils is legs. That means they did not walk up there. So how did they get up there? Well, hold on to that one. We also find seashells on top of Mount Everest. Yes, seashells on top of Mount Everest. How did they get there? Well, again, we don't find these seashells with the legs, which means they did not walk up there. How did they get there? where there's only one explanation, and that is at some point in time in the history of this earth, all those mountains had to be covered with ocean water. Now we know the mountains weren't always that tall because we've observed and actually seen by the sediments and fossils we find, these mountains were raised rapidly. But how did they all get covered with ocean water? There are two options. Number one, as the evolutionists might teach, the continents sank and came back up, and they sank and came back up. Or the other option is, there was a worldwide flood, as it states in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, that the waters covered the highest hills, covered the highest mountains by 15 cubits of water. Now, which one's true? When we study geology, one of the things that is 
very clear. These continents will not sink. You see, the sediments, the sediments are much lighter, the continents are much lighter than what we find in the ocean floor. And they're much less dense, which means the continents won't sink, they will have a tendency to float. So the only logical answer here is, based on geology and science, is the worldwide flood. So let's review. Let's do a quick review of our evidences. We looked at the Cambrian explosion. No transitional creatures at the bottom layers. We looked at a lack of transitions. Nowhere do we find any real transitions anywhere in the fossil world. We looked at the textbooks, the deception that is being used by hiring artists to draw these pictures to make them look real versus what was really found. We have a history of assumptions and mistakes done by the evolutionists. Number five, the fossil graveyards which show catastrophic events. And six, marine fossils found high up in mountains. Any one of these evidences supports the biblical model of created after their kind in a worldwide flood. But taken all six together is powerful, convincing evidence that evolution simply cannot be true and there was a worldwide flood and everything was created after its kind. So finishing up, let's take a look at just the facts now. Number one, it's important to note that virtually all the fossils used as evidence for evolution have been found in sedimentary rocks laid down by water. Second, these rocks are found all over the world, sediments laid down by water. Third, the fossilization of plants and animals does not happen over long slow processes. It takes rapid burial for this to happen. Fourth, we do not see any form of fossilization that we see that has occurred in the past happening today. And fifth, the existence of massive fossil beds, graveyards, indicates there was once or many or one catastrophic events that occurred in history. So our conclusion. The fossil record, what does it demonstrate? Two things, two things. Number one, all creatures were created after their kind. And secondly, the fact of a worldwide flood. Thank you and God bless you. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's Word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear.